Okay, so in the last few lectures, we've been discussing how to solve the wave equation and also discussing uh, various properties of solutions to the wave equation in one dimension. And so what we're gonna do today and for the next few lectures is, is move on to another one of the important equations uh, and, and do the same thing for, for this equation. Uh, in particular, we're gonna be looking at the diffusion equation in one dimension in space. Uh, Right, so when we derived the diffusion equation, remember we derived it in, in three dimensions, just to give an example of how these derivations work if you have mo more spatial dimensions. But in order to understand solutions, we're gonna begin with the, the simplest case, which is uh, the one dimensional case. Um, and so our, our approach here is gonna be a little bit different than for the wave equation. So remember the wave equation, we were able to directly attack the problem by factoring the operator and use some, using some of the ideas we learned when studying first order operators to find a, a solution. Uh, for the uh, diffusion equation, it's, uh, the matters are a little more, more difficult because the equation turns out to be a little bit harder to, to solve. Uh, so remember, well, what is the, the diffusion equation? Well, we have a function of u of, of x and t, where x is going to be assumed to be uh, a point on, on the real line, or potentially um, in some, some finite interval. So some of the, the things we're going to discuss today are going to be on, on a finite interval, um, but, but just one, one, one variable for space. And then, of course, there's a, there's a time variable, which corresponds to um, the system evolving over time as t increases. Um, and so this is a, well, this is a first order equation in T and second order equation in X. So the diffusion equation says that the derivative with respect to T of the solution is some constant K, which is a, some physical constant times the second derivative with, with respect to X, um, right? So if it's first order in T and second order in X, Well, the big difference when compared with the wave equation is that because of this, this discrepancy, even though this has one fewer derivatives, well, we can't factor the equation, right? So we, we can't factor like we did for the operator, uh, the wave equation. And because of this, it ends up, this ends up contributing towards sort of a, a, a higher level of difficulty in, in understanding how to solve it. Uh, just kind of, it, it, it really just boils down to this unfortunate, uh, almost algebraic fact that if you write out the operator for this equation, we, we can't factor it like we did for the wave equation. I mean, you would think since the wave equation involves two derivatives for time, it should be harder to solve than this, but that's that's not actually the case. Um, right, and so since it's gonna be a little bit difficult to to uh, obtain a solution formula for this equation, uh, what we're gonna do first is, is try to analyze the solutions to the equation on a slightly more abstract level and just talk about certain properties and symmetries that solutions to this equation have to have. And then using some of the ideas that we learn, we'll be able to derive the formula in, in a few lectures, um, right? And so today we're gonna be focusing on, on just one uh, very important theorem that describes solutions to the diffusion equation and describes certain like fundamental properties that they have. And so this is something that's gonna be called the uh, maximum principle. And so I want to begin just by, just with a little bit of motivation, explaining where this comes from, and then we'll state the, this, this result, which is a, a theorem. And then uh, the last part of the lecture will be devoted to a, a, a proof of, of the theorem. And so what's, well, what's the idea here? Uh, well, remember that, that the diffusion equation can also be thought of as describing, rather than like some dye diffusing out th throughout water, it can also be used to describe heat flow. Um, uh, in a certain simplified context, but recall the diffusion equation it, uh, also models heat flow. And so let's suppose that we're, right, so what do we mean uh, physically by this? Let's suppose that I have like a, a metal rod, say this, and say this is the point x equals a, and say my metal rod extends out to x equals b, Right, and suppose I have a, a heat source on one end, right? And so suppose when, when time t is equal to zero, uh, I heat up the right end, right? So let's say heat up at time 
uh, t is equal to zero. Well, in this, right, in this case, we have two boundary points in X. We have the boundary point when X is equal to A and when X is equal to B. And at the initial time, I'm, I'm beginning to heat up the right boundary point, right? Okay, and so what happens as T evolves? Well, as T evolves, of course, the heat is gonna flow um, to the right, or sorry, it's gonna flow from the right to the left, right? So the heat, heat flows this way. And the heat is gonna flow a lot like a, like a substance would diffuse in water, right? So this is why the diffusion equation also model, models heat flow. Um, and so if I, if I call my function U of X T, which is the, the temperature at point X, uh, and time t, uh, then this this function obeys the heat equation, or sorry, obeys the diffusion equation, which is also sometimes called the the heat equation. So the time derivative is is some constant time times the x derivative. Okay? So it obeys the the diffusion or heat equation. Um, well, notice that. Right, so let's look at the picture. Over here, we have the hottest point, right, initially. And over here is, is the coldest point, right? Well, as I let this heat continue to flow from the source to, to the, the other side of, uh, of the rod, well, eventually over time, the metal rod is gonna get hotter and hotter. But at any point in time, the hottest point is gonna be on the right-hand side and the coldest point is going to be on the left-hand side, right? Because it's the furthest away from, from the heat source. Okay, maybe eventually it will reach equilibrium and everything will be about the same temperature. But let's say for a, a certain period of time, over here, it's, it's not that hot. And over here, it's very hot. And so the heat will sort of distribute uh, to the left, right? And so we can describe this uh, mathematically in the following way. Uh, so what we basically just observed is if I look at values of my solution, which is like the temperature of the rod at, at point X and time T, uh, right? And so, so we're assuming like, like say X is like some point between A and B, right? Um, right, so if I look at the, the value of my solution, well, this is the temperature at, at a certain point X at a certain, at time T, where let's say T starts at zero and, and increases. Well, um, well, what is the, let's say we want to look at the largest possible value of our solution. Well, the largest possible value is, is the heat source, where the heat source is, right? So we just showed that, or, or from, no, we didn't show, but from this example, we, we see that for this particular function, the maximum temperature should be when X is equal to B, right? So if I look at the maximum over all X between A and B, this should be equal to the value when, when X is equal to B uh, for all time. Right. Like, for example, all, all t bigger than zero. Right. Uh, right. And that's just because this is where the, the heat source is over here. And similarly, we have uh, an observation about the minimum, right? So remember, the coldest temperature is on the left side, which is also one of the endpoints. And so mathematically, this means that, it, well, if we look at the minimum over this whole interval, then the minimum temperature, the smallest value of my solution occurs at the other endpoint, right? It occurs at the other boundary point when X is equal to A, right? And this is true for all T, right? And so what this basically says is that for this particular um, solution, the largest value occurs on, on the right boundary point and the smallest value occurs on, on the left boundary point. Okay, and so what is, well, what is this, this maximum principle that I'm trying to build up to? The maximum principle is like a general fact about solutions to the diffusion equation, uh, which basically says that th this sort of phenomenon always happens, meaning the maximum and minimum values are always on like the boundary of, of your domain um, for all time as, as T increases. Um, right, and so let me, let me state this now as, as a theorem. So there, there are a few different versions of, of the maximum principle. Um, what we're gonna do is study something called the, the weak uh, version of the maximum principle for the diffusion equation. Um, and so, okay, let's, it's, it's gonna require a little bit of setup before I state the full thing, but we're gonna, let's suppose that 
um, u of xt solves the diffusion equation. Um, so ut is equal to some constant k times uxx, where x is is on the real line somewhere. Um, and in particular, let's let's specify our, our domain a little bit. So let's suppose it solves the diffusion equation in the space-time uh, rectangle. Uh, say x is between x is in some finite interval, say between zero and, and l, and t is also in some finite interval, say between zero and, and capital T. Um, right. So visually, this domain is let's say this is the xt plane. So here's x. Here's t. Maybe this is capital T and maybe this is L. And so we're looking at um, this region here, right? The, the box that I just closed off is the, is the domain. And we're assuming that, that U solves the diffusion equation for all points inside this domain, um, right? And so the maximum principle says uh, the, the largest possible value of the solution, uh, so the maximum value of U um, occurs at some point on one on three of the on one of three of the boundary lines. So at some point on the boundary, just like we saw up here, right? So this is the idea. Uh, so the maximum value of u occurs at some point um, on one of the the boundary lines uh, where either x is equal to zero which is this line here, right? So this is, this is when x is equal to zero. Um, x is equal to L, which is this line here, or maybe initially on, on the bottom point here, um, when t is equal to zero, right? And so this is very, very similar to the example we were just looking at. So what happens when, if the maximum is at when, when x is equal to zero? This is like the example up here, but instead the heat source was put on the left side rather than the right side. Um, when x, x is equal to L, this is like when the heat source is put on the right side, right? And we saw for all time, uh, this uh, continued to be the largest value. And well, when T is equal to zero, well, maybe maybe instead you heat up the whole the whole metal rod and then you, you cut off the heat source when time is equal to zero. And then so it, it cools off. And so the hottest value is at the initial point. And then as time increases, it's cooling off, which is why you have to allow for, for this case. Um, Right, and so it may help visually if I just highlight on the picture these, these three lines. Um, so this line, uh, this line, and, and this line are where the, the maximum value could potentially occur, right? So this is x is L, this is when x is equal to zero, and this is when t is equal to zero. Um, notice that it's actually very important that I'm not including the top boundary line. So it's one of these three. Um, Okay, and so this is, this is the statement again. Let's, let's just quickly review. So suppose we have a solution to the diffusion equation in this domain, um, a particular closed space-time rectangle. The weak maximum principle says that the maximum value of the solution has to occur on, on one of these, these three red boundary lines, not the top one. Uh, right. Okay, and so why is this the weak maximum principle? Well, there's a version of, uh, of this, which I guess is typically called the strong maximum principle, which actually says that it cannot, the maximum cannot occur in the interior and it, it's only on one of these three lines. Uh, so notice this only says that there's some point on one of these three lines where the largest value occurs. It doesn't say that there could be, there could be a point in the interior where the maximum occurs. Uh, so it turns out that this is not the case. And so this is known as the strong maximum principle but it's a little more difficult to, to prove and understand this result. So we're just gonna focus on, on the weak ma maximum principle for now, uh, for us. <clears throat> okay, I, I also wanna point out, um, we'll notice over here, we, we talked about minimum values. Uh, so there's a version of, of this theorem, which is called the, the minimum principle, which turns out to be basically the equivalent to what we have here. And so let me just talk about that a little bit and then we'll turn towards trying to talk about why the maximum principle is true. Um, right, so let's, let me write a second theorem. Uh, so this is gonna be the weak minimum principle. And so the theorem is that the same is true for the minimum value. So just replace maximum here by, by minimum. 
Right, and so just as in the, the preliminary example we looked at, the, the coolest point was on the boundary. So the coolest point is like the minimum value of, of your function, of the temperature function, in the case of where, you, where we're thinking of, of heat flow, um, although this applies more generally just to any solution of the, of the diffusion equation. And so we would expect uh, that the minimum value should also be on one of these boundary points. Uh, right? For example, well, the, the two left and right boundary points, just look at the example from before, and how could the minimum occur when time is, is equal to zero? Well, maybe you don't turn on the heat source until exactly when, when you start the clock. And so initially it's just very cool. And then maybe you heat it uniformly throughout and the temperature increases over time. So the minimum would have occurred at the starting point. Um, right. Okay, and so what we're gonna do now is talk about how, how, to, how to prove these and that will take up the, the rest of, of the lecture. Uh, so the first thing that I want to point out is that it suffices to just prove the maximum principle because it turns out that the maximum principle will imply the minimum principle. Uh, so let me just add a remark about that and then we'll, we'll focus on, on the maximum principle. Um, Right, and so let's, let's just quickly try to explain um, why the maximum principle will, will imply the, the minimum principle. And so the idea is, well, let's suppose I have a function u of x t, which solves the diffusion equation. Well, since the equation is linear, let me, if I define the negative, like, so let's, let me define v as minus u of x t. Uh, this also solves the diffusion equation because of linearity. Right. Uh, well, let's look at the, let's suppose uh, the maximum for U is obtained at a particular point, right? So suppose um, M is the max value of U and suppose it's obtained at a particular point X naught comma, comma T naught. Um, well, if I take the, well, I, well actually let's, let's take a step back. What does it, what does it mean that M is the largest value? This means that, um, M is bigger than or equal to, uh, right? So M, which is equal to U of X naught comma T naught, assuming this is the point where the maximum is attained. This is always bigger than or equal to any other value of U in the, in the domain, right? Well, now we can relate this to our other solution V, which is just minus U by taking the negative, right? So this says that minus M is minus V of x naught t naught, which is less than or equal to um, minus v of x t, or sorry, just less than or equal to, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm mixing up uh, u and v. So, so if we take the negative of this equation, this says that minus m is equal to minus u of x naught t naught, which is less than or equal to minus u of x t. Right, that's what I meant, so sorry about that. And so while well, using the definition of v, this tells us that minus m is uh, v of, of x naught t naught, and this is less than or equal to every other value of v, right? And so this is a minimum value for v, right? So a maximum value for u is a minimum value for v because of these two equations. And so you can go back and forth between maximum and minimum principle just by using this, right? So it suffices to prove the theorem just for, for prove the maximum principle. Um, because otherwise, well, suppose the maximum principle were true and then you have a, a minimum point, you can convert that to a maximum point just by taking uh, the negative and then just apply maximum principle to conclude that it has to be on the boundary. And so that's, that's about it. Uh, there are a few details that, I, that I've left out, but this is the, the, the main idea. Um, okay, and so let's now, let's now move on and, and try to prove, discuss about how one would prove the, the weak maximum principle. And so this is gonna take a, a little bit of time uh, so it's not it's not an easy result, but we're we're gonna go through it uh, step by step and hopefully make it make it digestible. Um, right. right, and so what what I want to do is first begin with with the intuition for why you would expect this to be true. 
And so we're going to almost get a complete proof, which is going to be sort of short. And then what we're going to see is that, well, this doesn't actually work all the time. And so the rest of our, our job will be to like fix the, error, the mistake and try to make it work in general. And so this is, I'll begin with like an intu the intuitive uh, idea, uh, which will use some, some basic calculus. Okay. And then, right, so there's going to be a, a mistake here, which we're going to have to try to fix, which will take up the, the rest of, of the argument. Um, so let's suppose, uh, right, so we're looking at, at this particular domain. Let's suppose that um, we have a, a particular point where the maximum is obtained. Let me call it, say, x star t star, which is in the interior of the domain. Uh, so what we're going to do is do something like called a, a proof by contradiction. Right, so I want to show that the maximum value of u has to uh, occur on one of these lines. Well, let's try to understand, see if it's possible for it to occur inside. So what we're going to do is try to assume there's a maximum point that's outside of, of these lines and, and try to arrive at, at some kind of uh, contradiction. Um, and so in fact, this, is, this, this argument, if, if, it, if it works the way I write it, it would actually improve what I, prove what I call the strong maximum principle, although it's, it's not going to work. But it, it'll give us some, some intuition for the correct argument. Um, right, so suppose, let's suppose that um, x star t star is a maximum value, maximum for u in the domain. Well, I guess I just want to point out for, for those of you who are uh, wondering, like, how do I know that there is a maximum value? How do I know maximum is attained somewhere? Well, this is why we're looking at a finite domain. Uh, so notice this is a closed rectangle. And so because of the extreme value theorem, uh, as long as u is continuous, there has to be a maximum attained somewhere by the extreme value theorem. And so, of course, we're, we're assuming that our solutions are, are continuous. I mean, they represent like physical processes which are continuous. And I mean, we need to differentiate them. So they have to be continuous. Uh, so by extreme value theorem, there's a, some point where the maximum is obtained. Let's see what happens if it's in the interior. Um, right. Uh, well, since it's a maximum, we can use some of our derivative tests from, from calculus. Right, so in particular, we'll notice it's, if I vary t, it's a maximum in t. Like if I change t, the function can only decrease. Uh, and if I change x, the function can only decrease. So we can use some ideas from single variable calculus related to maximums uh, in, in each variable separately. And so in particular, um, well, if I take the time derivative ut at my maximum, well, remember if you take the derivative at a maximum point, it's a critical point, so this has to be zero. Uh, because it's a max in t, right? Right. So we're using like the first, what's usually called the first derivative test in t. Right. On the other hand, we also have a second derivative test. So let's use the the second derivative test in x. Um, so let's look at the second derivative at this point. Well, remember, if you have a, a maximum, you expect the function locally near the point, like say this is x star, to look like, like this. So it should be concave down. And so you would expect that the second derivative is negative, right? Because this is a max in x. Uh, and so this is the, the second derivative test in x. Um, right, and so well, at this point, notice I have a ut and a uxx. And I, have, I know that this solves a differential equation, so I should try to relate these to one another, right? So what we have, since u solves the diffusion equation, we have um, ut of x star uh, t star is equal to some constant k times uxx of x star uh, t star. Okay, well, on the left-hand side, we have zero, right, by the first thing. And on the right-hand side, we have something that's either, depending on the sign of k, this is either bigger than zero or, or less than zero. Uh, right, but in either case, it's a contradiction, right? Because I have zero on the left-hand side and I have something that's either positive, strictly positive or strictly negative on, on, on the right-hand side. 
And so this can't happen, right? And so you would think, okay, well, well, we're done, right? So this proves that the maximum can't be in the interior, so it has to be on the outside and, and that's it. Um, well, this almost works. The only issue is that there, there are some cases where this doesn't always apply. Right, for example, let me just write it up here. Um, we could have, like consider the function minus x to the four, right? So this looks a lot like, uh, like something like this where this is your x-axis, right? Well, if I look at, of course, there's a maximum at the origin, um, but if I look at the second derivative, uh, the second derivative is minus 12 x squared. Right, and so the second derivative could be zero, even though it's a maximum. And so this, this could be equality right down here. So this could be uh, equality. Right, and, and the reason is, well, remember when you had the second derivative test, there was another case where, well, if the second derivative is zero, it's inconclusive. And so you could get unlucky and you could be in one of these situations where it is a maximum, but the second derivative is zero, in which case there's no contradiction here. Uh, and so this argument is actually not, not valid in, in general, but it at least kind of indicates why you would expect the maximum to be true, maximum principle to be true from the perspective of, of like the calculus rules that, that you know. Um, and so what we need to do is, is try to fix, fix this. Uh, and so this is kind of a common idea in, in math, uh, math, mathematical analysis. A lot of the time you'll come up with something which may be like an intuitive argument, which seems correct, but then you'll realize there's some point, which, point in your argument which fails for technical reasons, like, like the fact that this could be a quality rather than, uh, so it could be less than or equal to, rather than equal to. Um, well, usually that's not the end of the story. And, and sometimes if you go back to your argument, you, you had done a lot right and you just, you just have to tweak some of the ideas and, and do a little bit more work and you'll be able to plug the, the leak in, in the argument. And so that's what we're gonna do here, right? So, so this idea of using the, the derivative test will still be relevant. We just have to solve, solve this, this issue. Um, and so this is, uh, we're gonna see a, a, another common trick in, in studying partial differential equations which will help us overcome the, this issue. And so the, the trick is, is the following. So we're gonna pick a very small number and we're gonna like perturb our solution a little bit to avoid this issue, uh, this issue up here. All right, so let's pick a, a very small number, which is positive. Uh, so usually mathematicians will use the Greek letter uh, epsilon, which looks like a curly E, right? And so what we're gonna do is eventually let epsilon approach zero, um, right? So this is a, a very small number that we're gonna, we're gonna imagine it's smaller than anything you can think of and eventually we'll, we'll let it converge to zero. It's gonna give us a small perturbation of our function, which allows us to make this argument work basically. Um, right, and so what we're go going to do to, to solve the problem is we're gonna just perturb our solution by a little bit. And so I'm gonna define a new function uh, v of x t, which is going to be uh, u of x t plus this constant epsilon, which is imagined to be a very small number times x squared. Uh, and so why are we introducing uh, this quantity? Well, remember the potential problem up here was when uh, the second derivative at our candidate point could potentially have been zero. So let's assume it is zero. Um, well, what happens if we look at the second derivative of, of this new function? Uh, so this is going to be equal to uxx of xt uh, plus, well, the second derivative of this extra term just ends up being 2 epsilon, uh, right? And so now let's let's see what happens if we plug in the point um, x star comma t star. Well, this is uxx of x star comma um, t star, and then we're just left with this other factor. Okay, well, if this were if this was zero then we're still okay because vxx at x star um, t star is not equal to zero, um, right? And so if we come back here, if v were a solution to the diffusion equation, then, then this argument would work, right? So this kind of fixes part of the issue. Um, part of the problem is, well, if I change my function in this way, it turns out that V will no longer solve the diffusion equation. And so we have to now correct that issue. Although it's, it's gonna, it's, 
going to be like sort of like almost a solution and we'll be able to, to make everything work. Um, and so what we're going to do now is, is define this function v as we just did and, and um, use this function v to complete the argument. Um, great. Okay. And so let's now, um, let's now, this is kind of just like a preliminary discussion. Let's now kind of dive into the full argument. Um, right. So, uh, right. Let's, let's now do the complete argument. Right. And so let me, let me just, right. And so let's, uh, let's proceed with, uh, the details. And so just to have a, a picture in mind, let me just draw the domain that, that we're looking at. Um, in the, the XT plane. So say this is the T axis, this is the X axis, and we're looking at points between zero and L for X and T ranges from zero to capital T. And so we want to show that the maximum value of our solution U has to occur on, on one of these three lines, right? Uh, of course, there's also the top line, which is uh, uh, the top part of the boundary. And we want to avoid, I mean, we want to avoid this, this point, uh, this line, right? So we want to show the maximum is attained on either uh, left side, right side, or on, on the bottom, right? So this is what, what we're trying to show. And so let's let's kind of attach a, a label to this quantity. And so let me let M be the maximum of U, um, or the max value of U on one of the three boundary lines, right? So on, on the red portion of the boundary. Well, what are we trying to show? Uh, we want to show that u is less than or equal to this value everywhere, right? So we want to show that u of xt is less than or equal to m for all points in the domain. Uh, and let me call our domain, say, r. So we want to show this is true for all points in the domain r. Uh, and so what we're going to do is, is, as we just discussed in the kind of preliminary discussion, is, is introduce this auxiliary function v, right, which is going to be a small perturbation of, of our solution, right? So we're adding on this epsilon times x squared, where eventually uh, epsilon will, will send epsilon to zero to recover information about our, our original function. Um, Okay, and so as, as we saw before, I mean, the big problem is that V is not actually a solution to the diffusion equation anymore once you do this, so we have to deal with this, this technicality. Um, in particular, well, let's see what happens if I differentiate this, right? So if, if I apply the, the operator associated to the diffusion equation, well, VT is just going to be UT um, because the term we added doesn't depend on, on X. But if I look at, say, VXX, this is now going to equal UXX plus 2 epsilon. Right, so now there actually is a difference. And so now if I apply the diffusion equation operator to V, well, I end up with VT minus K times VXX. And so plugging in, this ends up being uh, UT minus K times UXX plus two epsilon. Right, and so if I, if I rearrange this, I get UT minus K UXX uh, minus K times epsilon or two K epsilon. Right, and so this says therefore that if I look at the diffusion operator applied to this new function V, this is equal to minus two K epsilon. Uh, I mean, for, for most physical purposes, K will be bigger than zero. So let's just assume it's positive here. Uh, if it's negative, I mean, you can do something very similar and it will still work, I think. Um, well, then this is, this is strictly negative, right? And so it's no longer the case that this function V will solve the diffusion equation, although we have something that's almost uh, almost a solution, meaning we at least know it's uh, when I apply this operator, it's, it's, it can never be positive. Right? And so you may see this and think, well, how are we going to use this? I mean, it could be very far away from zero. What we're, what we're going to do is, is an argument very similar to what we saw up here involving a certain inequality. And it's going to turn out that it's okay to have like less than here uh, rather than uh, rather than equal to equal for our for our argument. So it's going to end up being being okay, um, right? And so so 
right, let's let's now dive in, into the details of the analysis for for this function v. And and so the point is, let, now let's let's try to understand um, maximum values for this new function v. Um, and so in particular, uh, right, we want to look at possible large values of v. In particular, what we're going to do is, is claim the following, uh, that for all points xt in, in the domain R, uh, we have v of xt is less than or equal to uh, m plus a small perturbation, which is related to this other factor, where remember m was the largest possible value of u on the red boundary lines, and then l is just the largest that x can be. Right. And so this is a natural kind of a natural guess, like a natural thing to prove from this definition. I mean, if u is always less than or equal to m, which is what we're trying to show, then it would certainly have to be the case that v is less than or equal to m plus epsilon times l squared, just because x is bounded by l, right? x is always smaller than l. Um, so let's try to prove that instead, right? So this is something that would be implied if the theorem was true, and maybe it's a little bit easier to prove. And so notice that it's enough to prove this, right? The claim that I just made, right? Because if this is true, well, on the left-hand side, we have um, u of xt plus epsilon x squared. And then on the right-hand side is less than or equal to m plus epsilon l squared. And so then, as I said before, we're going to just let epsilon go to 0 uh, to get u is less than or equal to m. And well, this is true for any point, and so this would imply then that uh, at every point u is less than or equal to m, so u is always smaller than a certain value on, on the boundary, uh, which is what we were trying to prove, right? And so now we see that it actually suffices to prove this claim for our, um, our perturbation function v, which is what we're, we're going to do. Okay, and so now the idea is to try to make the argument from the beginning work. And so uh, what did we do there? Well, we assumed that we had a maximum value which was in the interior, right? So let's let's suppose that once again, we know that, that V will attain its maximum in this domain because of the extreme value theorem. So let's suppose it's attained in, in the interior, right? So let's say up here, there's some point, say X star, um, T star, where V, attains its maximum, right? Um, so suppose V attains the largest value in the, in the interior. Right, well, we're gonna, we're gonna actually show that this cannot happen. Uh, so let's, let's try to understand why. Um, Right, so arguing as before, well, let's say the say the, the point is say x star comma t star, where v attains its, its maximum value and let's assume it's in the interior. Well, then by using the argument from the preliminary discussion uh, up here, let's just apply the, this argument to v, um, right? And so since this point is in the interior, I guess I didn't, I didn't uh, mention this, um, in too much detail before, but the reason we can apply these derivative tests is because we're in the interior and we're not at a boundary point, right? If you're at a boundary point, you can no longer apply derivative tests because they require you to be able to differentiate from both directions, which we don't, we can't do on, on the boundary, but you can do if it's on, a, a, on an interior point, right? Um, right, so arguing as before, we have to have, um, well, I have to have VT of X star T star is equal to zero. And then I have to have uh, VXX of X star T star. Well, it's no longer, it doesn't have to necessarily be uh, less than zero, but we at least know since it's a maximum, the second derivative has to be less than or equal to, to zero, right? Because it's con uh, concave down, right? Um, right, and so let's use these in combination with our equation for V that we just derived up here, right? So we have um, from before um, Vt 
is always uh, strictly less than, right, using this equation here, Vt is always strictly less than k times Vxx. Right, and so if I plug in these particular points, I end up with Vt of x star t star is always strictly less than um, uh, k times Vxx. Uh, of x star comma t star, but what does this say, right? So the first term here is just zero, right? And then the second term is always less than or equal to zero, right? So the existence of the maximum value for v, a, max, a point in the interior where the maximum value for v is, is obtained would imply something that's not true, right? So this would say that zero is strictly less than zero. Right, and so here, I mean, here it's very important that we had an, an inequality, a strict inequality, not less than or equal to. If this was less than or equal to, then this could be, this may not be true, but because of the the epsilon thing that we added here, uh, this epsilon perturbation from um, from up here, it's actually a strict inequality, right? Because this is not zero. So it's very important that it's a strict inequality rather than a uh, less than or equal to. Uh, right, well, well, in this case, it's a contradiction, right? And so therefore we, we assumed there was a point in the interior of the domain where the maximum was attained and we arrived at a contradictory statement. And so therefore our assumption must have been wrong, right? Because the reasoning here was all correct. Um, and so it follows that the maximum or the largest value for V um, cannot be attained in the interior, right? Right, so the, the maximum point, um, right, so if if x star comma t star is maximum point for v, it must be on the boundary. Right, and so this is kind of the key observation. Um, and so now what we need to do is, uh, well, we're almost done, right? So I was trying to show that that the maximum is attained somewhere on the boundary, basically, and we also want to want to show the uh, show this claim. Uh, the issue is, right? We just need to to check that that this bound here holds, right? And then then we would would be done. Uh, Right, and in fact, let me let me just expand on that because I may be I may be moving just a, a little bit too quickly. Uh, well, so notice that um, if I have any other point, say x comma t, in our domain, uh, then v of x t is always less than or equal to the maximum value, of course. Right. And so now it suffices to show the following. It suffices to show that V of X star T star is always smaller than M plus epsilon L squared, which is the, the claim from before. Right, so we're trying to show this claim for arbitrary points. Well, if I have any point and I plug it into V, that's always smaller than the maximum value. And so if we show the maximum value is always smaller than M plus, uh, L uh, to M plus epsilon times L squared, then we would be done. We would prove the claim and, and then the argument would be would be complete as, as discussed before. Um, so now it suffices to show that, that show the second inequality here, right? Uh, well, we just learned where our maximum point is. So from the previous discussion, well, we know that X star T star is on the boundary. Uh, so on the red boundary. Or not, sorry, not, not on the red boundary, just on, on the boundary of the, of the domain, including possibly the top line. Right. Well, it turns out that in all but one case, this is now easy to show uh, the inequality, right? So what are the three cases? Let's just come back to the picture. So either X star T star is on one of these three red lines or it's on the top dotted line. And so it turns out that if it's on one of the three red lines, then the claim is, is relatively easy to prove. So let's just look at that now. Um, so case one, 
uh, X star T star is on one of the three red boundary lines from before. And so in particular, this means that um, X star is equal to zero or X star is equal to L or uh, T star is equal to zero, right? And so in all of these cases, it turns out that um, that the, the claim is, is easy to prove, right? And so let me, let me prove it in, in each of these cases, right? So suppose X star is equal to zero. Well, then I have V of zero comma T star. Um, by definition, this is U of um, zero comma T, right? Because the, the term that we added on vanishes, but now this is always less than or equal to M, right? Because this is, this is on the red boundary. Right, so zero, the point zero comma t is just uh, this line here, right? But we assume that we chose this value m so that it's the largest on, on the red lines. And so of course, if I'm on one of the lines, u has to be smaller than m, right? So that case is okay. Of, of, course, um, of course, m is smaller than m plus epsilon times L squared, so we're good there. Uh, so let's look at the, the other cases. Well, now let's suppose instead that x is equal, x star is equal to L and t could be arbitrary, oh, sorry. Right, then v of l comma t star is now equal to u um, of l comma t star, uh, plus now epsilon times l squared, because we had to add on the, the x term here, right? We added on epsilon uh, times l, uh, x squared, and so if x is equal to l, we have to add on this term. But once again, the first term here is the a value of u on the red boundary, uh, once again, and so this also has to, the first term here has to be smaller than M and then we're left over with plus epsilon L squared. So this is okay as well. And then finally, we're the remaining, uh, the remaining possibility in this case is if um, T is equal to zero and X is arbitrary, right? So in this case, we have V of X comma zero. Well, this is now equal to U of X comma zero plus epsilon times L squared. Uh, well, once again, when, when T is equal to zero, we're, we're also on the red boundary line, right? So this would have been the bottom line up here. So we're in this case. And so for all these values here, U is also smaller than M by, by definition of this parameter M. And so if we come back here, um, this is always less than or equal to, um, oh, actually, sorry, this should have been an X squared. Right, so the first term is always less than or equal to M. And then we're left with M plus epsilon times X squared, but notice that that X is always smaller than L because that's the right boundary point. So this is always less than or equal to M plus epsilon times L squared as well, right? And so all of these cases are okay, right? And so, right, so are we done? Uh, well, unfortunately, there's just a little bit uh, more work to be done because, well, what happens if we're not in any of these cases uh, well, we know that this point has to be on, on a boundary line, but we've only covered three here. So what happens if it's on the top boundary, right? So this is the final case to consider. Um, so the final case is, is X star comma T star is on the top boundary line um, where T is equal to capital T, right? So if we come back to the picture of our domain, there's potentially an issue with the argument if it's obtained up here, because notice this value, we only know information about uh, the relation between U and M if it's on one of the three red lines. So we can't use the same argument that we just used if it happened, if this X star T star happened to be on the top line, right? So the final part of the argument is now showing that that can happen, right? And then, and then we'll be done, right? Right, so we're going to show that this can't happen. Once we can show that this can happen, then it has to be the case that we were in case one. And in case one, we proved the inequality we needed. And so the claim is proven in, in case one. And so then we're done, right? So to finally complete the proof, we just have to show that, that case two can't happen, meaning 
the maximum value, the point where the maximum for V is attained cannot be on the top boundary line of, of the domain. Um, right, and so let's, let's just draw another copy of, of our picture. So this was the line uh, T is equal to capital T. And so this was the other, the other piece of our, our domain, right? And so let's assume for, again, for a contradiction, let's say that the point was actually here, right? So this is like the bad case, which we wanna rule out. Um, right, well, we still have um, certain observations about the, the derivative. Uh, and in particular, well, we still, um, we can still apply the second derivative test in X, right? Well, why is that? Well, just let's say we fixed we fixed t star, right? So we're just looking at a slice, and so we can vary x. The only the only read uh, part of this domain where you can't apply the second derivative test would potentially be at the corner points, which are the boundary of this top interval here. Uh, but the corner points are, are on the are in the good region, right? So corner points are on the left and right red lines, so those are fine. And so we can assume that it's actually in the interior of this dotted line, in which case, since you can vary it in both directions, we can apply a second derivative test in X. And so in particular, we still have uh, VXX at X star comma T star less than or equal to zero. Great. Okay, and so unfortunately we can't use derivative tests in T because I can't vary T uh, vertically uh, up and down, right? I can only, I mean, T, T is really uh, fixed, right? So we can't really apply any, any derivative tests, uh, but we can do something that's almost as good. And in particular, let's, let's suppose that we, we fix this point X star T star, and let's consider a point that's right below it, right? And so let's say this point is X star comma T star minus a small number, say minus H, Right, so let's just perturb the point a little bit. Uh, well, since this point is assumed to be a, a maximum value for V, we know that this in particular has to be bigger than or equal to V of X star evaluated at, at this new point, right? Because this is, the, I mean, this is just the definition of what it means to be a maximum, right? If I change this point, my value has to decrease. It could stay the same or it could decrease, right? Uh, and so in particular, this has to be true. And then, okay, well, let me just bring this over to the other side. So this tells me that, uh, let's just flip this around. Zero is less than or equal to V of X star comma T star minus V of X star comma T star minus H, right? Well, this should now remind you of like a difference quotient from calculus. And so in particular, if I divide by H, where H is bigger than zero, this is always true. Uh, but this is just the difference quotient for taking the derivative with respect to T, right? And so what I'm gonna do now is, is take the limit as H goes to zero. This is gonna converge to the partial derivative with respect to T, just by definition of the partial derivative, right? And so we conclude that um, zero is always less than or equal to the T derivative of V at X star comma T star, right? And so now we're gonna be able to use we've recovered sort of the, the inequality we need to use the, the argument from the beginning, right? And combine, combining with these, right? And so finally, we're just bear with me for another minute. We're, all, we're almost there. Uh, let's just plug in the, the, what we have, right? So then, uh, well, on the one hand, uh, we know from our earlier inequality that, uh, Vt is always less, strictly less than k times Vxx, right? So let's just come back and plug that in here. Um, so I know Vt of, of x star here, comma t star is always strictly less than k times Vxx of x star comma t star. And this was true for all points, right? Now let's plug in these two identities. Uh, so we know that the second derivative with respect to X at this point is always less than or equal to zero. So on the right-hand side, this should be less than or equal to zero, assuming K is bigger than zero, which, which we are. Um, but we just showed that the, um, the time derivative is, is positive, right? It's always bigger than or equal to zero. And so on the left-hand side, this is always bigger than or equal to zero. Um, 
from the, the second calculation here, but we've once again arrived at a contradiction, right? Because I have a strict inequality in the middle. So this says zero is less than or equal to zero, which is not possible. Right? And so we've showed that case two can't happen, right? We've ruled out uh, case two. And so as discussed before, this completes the proof, right? Right, and so this is a somewhat involved and elaborate uh, argument, but I think there are, there are a few important ideas um, which uh, are, are worth learning. Uh, in particular, this idea of, right, so no, nobody would just sit down and immediately come up with the argument I've just presented on the spot. Uh, what I mean, more reasonably, maybe someone would come up with this intuitive idea after thinking about it for a little bit of time. You would think to try to use derivative tests and the equation, you would arrive at something like this. And then you would realize, okay, well, maybe this doesn't quite work. And then this would, would lead you to this idea of maybe trying to perturb your solution a little bit to make it work. Uh, this in turn causes a few other difficulties with, which have to be dealt with. And, and then, so this is what would lead you to construct this more elaborate argument. Uh, of course, you would never be asked to do something like this uh, on an exam or on a homework problem, right? This is just kind of, we're just trying to introduce the, the maximum principle and, and carefully learn, learn the proof. But you're not expected to come up with, with something like this on your, on your own, of course. Uh, all right, and so that's, that's it for today. Uh, so this is the, the last lecture video for, for this week, but because of the break, short break in the middle, but starting next week, we'll continue uh, talking about the diffusion equation.